I couldn't stand Drew. <laughs> Drew was a new kid in my sixth grade class. And he showed up, and he was tall. I was tall. And he played football. We had a flag football team in sixth grade. I played football. I played tight end. Drew wanted to play tight end. I loved the tight end position in football because, one, you got to kind of bump into people and block, and, but you also got to catch the ball, and you were never expected to run very fast as a tight end, which was perfect for me. Um, and I was all, always a little bit bigger than other kids in my class. But then Drew showed up. I couldn't stand him. He was nice, psh, tall, kind, athletic. Drew was a good speller. Now, not to brag, but you were looking at the Linwood Elementary School sixth grade spelling bee champion. And I had to beat Drew. Drew. Come to seventh grade, Drew and I, we, we both go up to the junior high and we, you know, ch things change in junior high. And we had a homeroom, Drew and I both playing football, both going out for tight end position. The homeroom teacher was Mr. Triplett, our football coach and homeroom teacher. Mr. Triplett liked to talk about football at the beginning of the day. And Drew and I would try to engage with him about football, but Drew would always talk louder than me or, or say something first. And Mr. Triplett and Drew seemed to become friends. And boy, I couldn't stand Drew. And now I couldn't stand Mr. Triplett. Just, 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 they, uh, they bugged me. I, I became disruptive in class. I, I kind of got snarky with Mr. Triplett. Uh, I looked for reasons to contradict Drew for some reason. I just didn't like Drew. And Drew would talk louder than me, talk over me, and Mr. Triplett would uh, prefer Drew over me as the, the narrative I told myself. So those two things gave me the reasons to keep this posture of argument and, and, and strife against Drew and Mr. Triplett. Why did I do that? Why did I choose those postures against two people who probably didn't even think of me in that way at all? But they were my enemies. And, and I bet you if you do some reflective work on you, you've got people in your life that you just don't like or you consider against you. Maybe it's someone who's more of a, um, you ever heard of a me monster? <laughs> I heard that phrase, but it's, it, when you're in a conversation with some, somehow, two sentences in, the conversation is all about them. They flipped the script. Now you thought you were talking about something, and now they're, they're making it about, about themselves. Maybe there's something silly, like they talk too loud. Or maybe it's someone who in a crowd just hasn't given you an acknowledgement, and so they're your enemy. Maybe those are some silly reasons. Maybe you have some really good reasons. Maybe someone you know is a 49ers fan. Just saying. But you've chosen that you're their enemy, they're your enemy, and there's strife. James addresses that issue right out the gate in James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. So that's where we're going to start. Because remember, James is talking about when you're going through a hard time, when things seem difficult, remember, there's joy to be had. There's joy to be had, and, and you can find the joy by asking God for wisdom, and God will give you the wisdom. If you ask with a humble heart, you'll get the wisdom, and then you can look at your reflection in the mirror and see and remember the ways that God is working in and on your heart. And you will be transformed to become more and more like Jesus. And this maturing that happens is a gift from God. It's the crown of life. And, and this, because this maturing is happening, if your goal is to become more and more like Jesus, you can consider the existence of the trial itself pure joy. Because the fruit of it is you are becoming more and more like Jesus. That's the lane that James is in through this whole book. And everything he talks about is in somewhere in that continuum. And he's in this section where he's going back and forth between, like, here's, here's the way the world would have you handle struggles. And it comes from a selfish heart. And then 
He says, and here is how God would have you handle struggles. So be aware of these things and do these things. And he draws this contrast of two sides. One is marked with human pride and one was marked with human humility. So let's pray and let's get into it. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. I thank you that these, these, these words that are preserved on this holy page can speak to our hearts today in a way that helps us become more and more like you, helps us face our struggles and our challenges, helps face those things that are hindering us from growing and, and, and transforms us into who you've created us to be. Help us to see that today so we can grow in you. Help us to long to grow in you so we can see our trials as joyful. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so James has made this binary contrast. We can either, uh, our trials can either sanctify us or desecrate us. Right? One makes us more holy one leads us more and more into sin. Those are the contrasting things that he's doing, and it all depends on the heart posture you choose, humility or pride. So, verse 1 of chapter 4. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? So James just comes out swinging. He says, you, you have a quarrel and a fight among you. And, and if I ask you what causes it, you might say, well, Drew is just a doofus and he talks louder than me. And Mr. Triplett just ignores me. Who's your Drew and, or Mr. Triplett? Like what's causing the quarrel? And James says, you know, that what causes that quarrel among you? It's passions that are, it's, it's convictions that are at war within you. And I think he, he leads us to the only thing that's helpful in a conflict or a quarrel. The only thing you can change is you. So that's the only thing that's helpful. So he moves, moves the conversation deep inside of you. Say, okay, what's the issue here? It's inside of you. Could it be that my frustration with Drew and, and Mr. Triplett was there's a war within me? Maybe I was insecure about my role, my social standing, this little place I've carved out for myself in my class with my classmates, uh, being this type of kid, and then that was threatened. Maybe my identity was tied to that. Maybe I had the selfish ambition to be the star tight end. And I saw Drew as a threat. Verse 2, James says, You desire and you do not have, so you murder. Now, we'll use murder to say, like, when we gossip and slander, the example he used before, when we speak ill of someone, when we seek to, to justify our argument with them by assassinating their character. All of that, James says, is a war within us. We desire, we do not have, so we murder. We covet what we cannot contain, co obtain, so we fight and quarrel. And you do not have because you do not ask. Now, this is where it takes a turn. We have to be aware of what he's talking about. You do not have what because you do not ask. Well, just probably 10 minutes ago in his writing, he told us to ask for something, James. So chapter 2, this is what he's asking. This is what he's telling us. No, I mean, sorry, chapter f uh, 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. So you do not have wisdom and how to handle this situation or, or the completeness and maturity to be loving in this situation, to be selfless, to be mature. In this, so you lack that because you don't ask. What he's emphasizing here is the rest of that. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given to him. So if you're lacking wisdom, if God is one who gives the wisdom to those who ask with a humble heart, you're either not asking 
or you're not asking with the right heart. And that's what he continues on to say. You do not have because you do not ask. Verse 3, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Now, the word spend here, I, I don't, I'm not a Bible translator, so I'm not going to say they use the wrong word, but sometimes that word can infer specifically can make us think of money, and then this can be completely taken out of context. Because James isn't all of a sudden talking about finances here. He's talking about asking for wisdom. And then what do we do when we come and ask, seek, seek God with a prideful heart? What do we get? What perspective do we have? We get some type of worldly wisdom, some type of insight that says, yeah, they did do that thing. They are worthy of your bitterness and anger. They do not deserve your grace and favor because they are that type of person. That's just what is fair by the world's standards. Because remember, James is drawing this contrast by the way the world would have you handle conflict and the way God would have you handle conflict. So the wisdom that you get, you spend it to gain more of the worldly junk. So it's not the holy wisdom from God that you receive, that you spend. You spend it on your passions. You, you, you cash in this wisdom to justify your passions. Now remember what he said of the passions that are at war within you. This is the second time he's used the word passions, right? The passions are at war within you. So you double down and you, it kind of lights on fire the passions that are already causing the strife. Verse 4. Now he starts using some language that's really interesting that equates our relationship with God with a covenant-type relationship, like a marriage. He says, verse 4, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? So when we choose to go in the way of the world and handle things in conflict in the way of the world, we're choosing to be the enemy of God, the opposite of God. And what's happening here is he's kind of drawing us to this conclusion that when we choose the way of the world, we are acting in disbelief that God is all-powerful, that God is all-knowing, that God is capable, that God loves us and God is for us, and that God wants to help us grow and mature in and be sanctified in this life, and that he will extend that to us. When we choose the way of the world, we're choosing the enemy of that. We're choosing to work against God. So, he uses that phrase, that word, you adulterous people. As if, like the idea of an adultery is like there's a covenant that has been broken. There's a promise that God has made, that we have made, and we're acting in disbelief and disregard for that promise when we disregard um, living out what James calls the royal law, right? He calls the royal law is to love one another as yourself. And what that implies is this selflessness, this I'm going to work on myself and believe and hope and be the best me for you in this situation. So when we betray that, we betray and we choose en enmity with God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Verse 5, or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made dwell in us? Or do you just not believe that God loves you and he's passionate for you and he yearns jealously? Like jealousy, there's a righteous anger that is called jealousy. God does have a right to our heart. There is a covenant ex that exists that he set in forth in creation and he redeemed it when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave. He establishes a covenant with us. So when we choose to become his enemy, we are betraying that covenant and the appropriate response to betrayal of a covenant is jealousy. And God has already extended his grace towards us. The jealousy of, that God has towards us affirms his love for us. His claim on us, his desire that we would be in him <clears throat> and in the spirit of what James is saying, especially when things are hard. When things are hard is where it's proven. When things are hard is where God cashes the check to build your faith. When he shows up in the midst of your trial, 
And James is drawing all these contrasts that when you abandon faithfulness to God, it looks like things like cheating on your taxes. It looks like things like gossiping and slandering against your neighbor, uh, compromising your integrity, uh, moral compromise for the sake of financial gain. Those are the ways of the world. Manipulating people to use them for your own benefit. Those are the ways of the world. Those are acting in contrary to the royal law of love your neighbor as yourself. The ways of God are to look inside yourself and say, God, what are you doing in me? Reveal in me a way to get the wisdom and grow. And if that's the lane I stay in, that's where the pure joy is. So when we are called out as adulterous people, the jealousy of God has established that God's grace is waiting for us. Like, look at verse 6. How does God respond when we choose this heart posture of being against him and we're trying to take things into our own hands. Here's what he says, verse 6. But he gives more grace. That's what the jealous God does. He gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Now, keep in mind, God isn't reacting to us, right? God has made these uh, cosmic establishments, like these establishments that exist. His grace towards us is there. God isn't reacting to us. It's there. God gives more grace. And so... Our heart posture, when we go from choosing the things of the world to choosing the things of God, the process of doing that is humility and repentance. And what gives us confidence to do that is that the jealous, loving God has already established that his grace abounds. So we can have confidence that says, when I've made these mistakes, I can, with my humble heart, I can come and I can seek wisdom from God and his grace is there and he gives the wisdom. That's the promise. God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. If you keep choosing the way of the world, that's pride. That's saying, I know better. I can do better. I can fix this. I can manipulate this. I'm going to use my own sense of morality and justice to get, to get through this and to fix this struggle. God opposes that. Because that leads to our destruction. And a loving father would never endorse anything that leads to your destruction. He'll love you through your bad choices. But you won't find the wisdom in that. You won't find the crown of life of maturity in going against God. So, of course, a loving father would never do that but he always has a posture of grace, giving favor to the humble heart who repentantly comes and says, God, I will trust you in the middle of my trial. I will sing hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I will declare your goodness through the pain and suffering. I will not give up. I will not falter. God gives grace to the humble heart. It's already there waiting So because God gives grace to the humble, that's the reason, verse 7, submit yourselves therefore to God. It's this trust. You can trust that God has given grace to the humble, so therefore humble your heart. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And verse 9, he does the other. Now, this can be jarring if you don't kind of take a moment to put this in the contrast. If you notice, James is going back and forth between good and evil, good and evil, the way of the world, the way of the Lord. And this one he's saying, or, verse 9, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy turned to gloom. If you keep choosing the way of the world and refuse to humble yourself and repent and seek God's way and trust him in the midst of your trials, this will lead to your, your, uh, you will mourn and weep, your laughter will be mourning and your joy will be gloom. And then he says it again, verse 10, 
Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. He will exalt you. And then in verse 11, he draws another contrast of the way that we will take, try to take things in control by shaping the narrative, by trying to control and manipulate the situation. He says, verse 11, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. The moment we get in the position of judging... We're not doing the law. Now, what is the law? If you remember chapter 2, verse 8, James says this. He says, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. That's the law he's talking about. When you assume to judge and slander, speak evil against your brother. You're refusing to see them as an image bearer of God, someone who's worthy of forgiveness, worthy of justice, worthy of faithfulness, worthy of kindness, worthy of fairness. Even if they are choosing enmity with God, it is the grace of God that gives them the path and almost like the permission inside themselves to humble themselves and repent. So we want to be on the side of God where we're echoing God's heart that says when you repent, there's an open door here. When there's, when there's a restoration of humility in you, when you see that going down that road will lead to your laughter turning into mourning and your joy turning into gloom, there's a repentance and a humble heart that will happen. And I want to be standing on God's side, cheering you on, being your friend, being an open door when you come back. So in order for me to do that, I have to not slander you. I have to not condemn you. I have to love you. And the royal law says, love you like I love myself because that very thing I just talked about you do that to yourself all the time. You always, in your mind, can justify your behavior. I had a moment of weakness. I'm really struggling. You know, hurt people hurt people, and I'm hurting, so I'm hurting people. I'm just a man. Right? You make, I'll say this practically, not condemningly, you make excuses for yourself all the time. Practically, we all do. C.S. Lewis says, there's one man who lies to me all the time. And I forgive him all the time. And that man is me. No one lies to me more than me. No one justifies things more than me. We are called to love each other as we love ourselves. Extending that identity of you are made in the image of God. You are worthy of God's grace. God is there for you. And it's up to God to oppose the proud. It's up to God to, to, God has already established that opposing God's will doesn't go well for you. So I want to be there in your life when you come back. I want to be someone who reminds you that, yeah, repentance, humility. God will restore. God will give you the wisdom that you're seeking in the midst of your trial. But watch what he does here in verse 13. Because he kind of says, okay, let's take this to another level. How else do we try to take things in control? How else does our prideful heart, when we abandon humility, how else do we try to take control? How many of you have thought, man, if I could just move out of town and start over somewhere else, this problem would be solved? If I could just go and get a whole new, whole new thing, I'm just going to start over. Or how many of you said, man, if I just had the money to deal with this thing, I could fix it? Those are two things that we kind of lean to, like I'm just going to go start over instead of deal with this here. And if I just had the money, I could like, pay someone else to deal with this problem. Or I could rise above this or not have to deal with it or throw money at it. In, in, in business, there's a saying like, uh, that, that sales covers a multitude of stupidity. And I know I've been, I know Harry's been, I know some of the companies Harry's worked for. We have worked for companies that the sales are great and it covers up the fact that it's a dysfunctional company that doesn't work in our spiritual life with God. Money doesn't fix things. I've, I've been in 
part, stage of life where I've had a windfall. I got friends uh, I've grown up with who are multimillionaires. And like overall, and some of you know this, like money doesn't fix your problems. It just gives you way more options to express your dysfunction. Like, because whatever is in you is going to come out. And when you have money, that can come out. If you have a spending problem and you have no money, that means that you buy a shirt when you don't need one. If you have a spending problem and you have tons of money, that means you buy an island when you don't need one, right? The, my dad used to say something. And growing up, I always thought it was the, like a dumb dad thing. But as I got older, I went, whoa, that's true. He used to say, hey, no matter where you go, there you are. Like, yes, that is accurate. But then I realized, like, in the context of this, if you think that leaving town is going to solve your problems, James is saying, what causes the quarrels? Isn't it the passion and conflict inside of you? The problem moves to the town with you because it's in you. The problem that you had in this town, you'll have that same problem in the new town because the problem's inside of you. Come now, you who say, verse 13, today or tomorrow we'll go into such and such a town and spend the year there and trade and make a profit. He's addressing both like, I'm just going to change, I'm going to take control. I'm not going to endure and find the wisdom to be gained in the midst of this trial. I'm going to just short circuit it and go over here and start fresh and avoid that. But guess what? That comes with you. And your joy becomes mourning. And then he says, you're going to go and make a profit. And then, then what he does is he kind of gives us this really practical reason why we should choose humility. Because up until now, he's been saying like, hey, in your own heart, in your own, like you need to humble yourself and, and don't choose pride because it will go bad for you. And now it's like almost there's like this objective lens that just says, hey, and in reality, guys, let's just be honest. Let's look at this objectively you probably should be humble. And here's why. He says, yet you, you don't know what tomorrow will bring. We don't know. We don't know what tomorrow, what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen when we leave here today. We don't know. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. You are, your, your translation may say vapor. You are but a vapor. That, so let's just look at things in reality, you and your problems and, and all of eternity and, and all of this. Like If you think that you are going to be the one that takes control in your own way and, and betrays the ways of the Lord that he has set for all eternity and you're going to figure out your own way to do it, remember, you're not God, you're not even close. You're just, you're a mist. Like, all we are is dust in the wind. Right? So it's almost like this honest, reflective thing that kind of pulls us out of the, the drama of, of all of our emotion and all of our trial and says, okay, I'm, I'm not in control of this. It's prideful for me to think I can be. The only option is to humbly seek wisdom from the Lord and trust in him and remain faithful. And so in verse 15, instead we ought to say, if the Lord wills, we'll live and do this or that. Now, I love this because I am, uh, I was hanging out with my best friend the other day, uh, Pastor Ben, and he always uh, tells me this, and I don't know if he's like, sometimes it sounds like he's like, it's like a curse. But he goes, Mike, you're a high D, right? And in personality traits, that's a high driver. You're an extremely high D. And it's hard to keep up sometimes. You're a, high, you're a driver. You're doing, you're doing. And so, uh, to be honest, when I hear this, you know, just, hey, don't, don't try to take things in your own hands and, and trust in the Lord. Sounds like this little fairy tale kumbaya moment where I'm just going to sit in a circle and go, oh, trust in the Lord, and da, 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 and just wait for the universe to fix itself. And that just does not compute with me. 
And I don't think it computes with James here. He says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and go do this or that. Like, there is something for us to do, but let's let our driving be in the obedience to the wisdom of the Lord. If we want financial freedom, let's not go and compromise and, and our morality to get more money, save more money, or spend less money. Let's not lie and cheat. Let's take the action to do things like work hard and save and live with integrity and be wise and shrewd with our investments and to engage in the management of our finances instead of just sit back and just let it happen, like direct deposit, direct spending, who cares? I don't even know. No, 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 no. If the Lord wills, we will live and do this and do that. There is something for us to do. There's a stewardship for us to have. But it's in the ways of the Lord with integrity and a love for one another where we prioritize generosity over, over consumption. And that's something to embrace not only with your finances, with your time, with your heart, with your affections, with your relationships. Prioritize generosity over consumption. That's the work we do. How do you resolve a conflict? He says at the beginning of the chapter, you don't look at the other person and say, if they would just only change. You look at the passions inside your heart that are at war. The title of this sermon is God Chose Sides. Or it used to be God Has a Favorite. God has already declared that he's on the side of the humble heart the one that elevates love your neighbor as yourself over the pride that wants to take control and consume and set yourself up or to be the winner or be the victor or be the starting tight end for your sixth grade flag football team. Like, whatever it is, elevate the others. Verse 16, as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Verse 17, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is a sin. Now, the sin that he's talking about is what he's been talking about the whole time. When we go to the Lord and seek wisdom, you may go to him with a humble heart, and you'll see that he gives you something to reflect on. Through the whole process, he uses the image of of looking in the mirror and remembering what you see, right? Through that whole process, you're going to be reminded of your shortcomings. And you're going to be reminded of the things that you can do to bring peace, the things that you can set your heart to and set your mind to, to overcome and receive that crown of life, which is the wisdom that comes from that self-reflection. If you see that and you don't do it, That is what the sin is. That is missing the mark. This isn't about losing your salvation. That isn't saying you're not a Christian. It's just saying, as you wrestle with this, remember, if you receive it and you don't do it, for you, that is, you've missed the mark. And what does God have for those who miss the mark? When we turn to him with a humble heart, grace upon grace upon grace. Always responding. He has already responded to your humility with salvation, with wisdom, with restoration. He's already done that. So when we choose that in our trials and we ask, he is faithful to give us the wisdom, respond to our humble heart. Heavenly Father, I just pray that as we reflect on this type of trial, where we're tempted to take things into our own hands and and change our situation or pursue riches or to do anything that threatens you in pursuit of us, your jealous and beautiful pursuit of us, that you long for our hearts. God, I pray that we would come to you with humble hearts right now and establish you are our king, you are our God, we are your people. God, help us worship today, God, with bold and open hearts. Even right now, if there's repentance that needs to happen and humility that needs to be taken hold of, God, I pray that 
we would be reminded that your spirit of grace has already been established and it's, you are eager and waiting for us to repent and come to humility. And you promise you will give us the wisdom and the courage to, to endure our trial and to grow. God, we trust you and we thank you. Let us worship you with our full hearts in Jesus' name. Amen.